If there's athletics, why is there athletics for boys alone? If there's cricket, why is there cricket for boys alone? I'm just saying things like that would need to change in the Caribbean in order to start developing and keeping our young athletes, our young girls and boys. Welcome to the Caribbean Sports Entertainment Management Group. We present to you the Value of Sports Program, a program which is designed to be able to speak to sportsmen and women all around the world. But today, it's closer home to us. And we're speaking to Stacey Ann King from Trinidad and Tobago, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, a former West Indies player, football referee in her own right, and also a business, sports business administrator. It's also our first female guest on most of our platforms, whether it be OnDrive, Football Insight, or the value of sports. And so for Cal Blankendell and myself, this is really indeed an honor as we welcome Stacey and King to this special segment called the value of sports. Welcome, my dear. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you guys for having me. I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> First thing, I think, you know, it'd be nice for me to maybe just start and just give a little background in terms of Stacey and King. And we will start with the cricket because that is passionate to Stacey Ann. And it's also passionate that she's into football and this, the sports side of the administration and organization. But if folks are wondering who we're speaking to, we're speaking to Stacey and King who would have played for the West Indies women's cricket team and would have made her debut a long time ago since 2008. And I was just going to some stats just before I get Stacey and to talk about how she got involved in cricket and to be able to find out from her what inspired her because she would have had, she could have been an athlete, she could have been a footballer, but what ignited you to get into cricket? Actually cricket wasn't my first sport. I played football, I played national football for one year, but I played softball cricket prior to that with my community team, Brooklyn United. Um, Stephanie Powers was actually my mentor. She was the person that saw me and decided that I can, she saw something in me that, you know, she thought that I could be on a national team on a West Indies team. And I think it was history from there. Uh, in 2007, I think it was, I would have joined a club team, a local club team in Trinidad, Hattie Food Spice Girls. And I led, I captained that team and we won that national league that year and made it to the West, to the Trinidad team. And within that year, made it to the West Indies team, what made West Indies trials and the rest was history more or less. It's important that you're talking about Stephanie Power because she was the third player from the West Indies to also be played the last test match for the West Indies, which was in 2004. The captains before West Indies record at that level would have been, they would have played some 12 test matches. Louise Brown was the first West Indies test captain, um, 1976, eight matches, one, one, drawn six and lost one, and Patrick Whitaker in 1979, and then Stephanie Power in 2004. You made it and you played T20 and ODI cricket. But just one regret for you is that you never had an opportunity to play test cricket. How do you feel now? I mean, yeah, I've, I've never, it's under Cricket West Indies, we've never had a test for this present group of, of, of ladies. Um, to be honest, they say, you know, there's this saying that if you haven't played test cricket, you haven't played cricket. So to be honest, because I haven't retired officially just yet, if it is that it does happen or it pops up sometime in the probably next couple of months before the year ends, and there's a possibility I may just come out of that mental retirement and play test cricket. Now let's talk about your career, um, ODI T20 cricket. You can remember your, your first game, getting your first cap, either T20 or ODI. That's been a long time ago, 2008, kind of peaking your brains. <laughs> It, it has been a long time ago, but that was a, 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 an experience that I can't forget. I mean, 2008 being in Ireland, we had a European tour, Ireland, Holland, and England. 
And I mean, it was it was tough because those are conditions that we weren't accustomed to. It's cold. You had your hand, you had hand warmers in your pockets. You were just it was just totally different. And then, of course, running and having to train in, in those conditions kind of gave some of us nosebleeds because we weren't acclimatized just yet. So it was tough. But uh, making back the West Indies team last two years and going back to Ireland, I mean, it brought back some memories, some some really great memories. What would you say to young girls aspiring to become young cricketers? Because you were just talking about your first tour in England. And Cal can tell you about England. I can tell you about England. So many folks can tell you about England. It is not an easy place to play sports. But what's your message to young people? For me, it has always been, uh, if I intend to start playing any sport or, or get myself into any activity, I must go through it. I want to see myself at the highest level. So get started my thing is just get started what is football and even though i'm a cricketer and i've played to the highest level for cricket i tend to not tell children or, or tell parents to put their children in one particular sport because i play that sport or i have excelled in that sport to me sports on the whole is important it gives you it builds something different within you being able to manage that time as well being able to manage practice and schoolwork mentally i think it's 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 great it's, it's something that I don't think enough is being put into. And I think the motor skills, especially, the development of bone structure, all the, it, there's so many psychological parts in it that if I am to say to anybody who has children, get your child into some sort of sporting activity. It builds that child. Now let's talk about the structure of Trinidad and Tobago, women's cricket. How, was, how has that structure impacted your career? It was tough and I won't lie, it most definitely was tough because I came from a rural area, I came from countryside and having to, you know, train with a national team meant that I had to travel at least an hour and a half to get to training, especially with a gear bag, which, because at that time I don't have my own transportation, so it's, it was tough. The structure in Trinidad is, there's a lot of cricket happening, there's senior women's team, there's divisional cricket in terms of there's a grade A, there's a senior division, and then there's a grade B division, but there's also secondary schools, cricket. But I, to me personally, I think it needs to be a bit younger. You need to start targeting young girls from primary school because of the fact that once young ladies start to develop, they start to get afraid of the ball, they don't wanna get dirty. You know, some different fears start coming into place. So once you get them from, primary school level and introduce them to it and they have a love for cricket or sport, it becomes part of them. We, we will go back to the T20 and ODI last. Your highs and lows for West Indies during your T20 career? Um, my high will definitely be 2016 winning that World Cup in India. I mean, we had a horrid season in South Africa before we went on to India and just coming together as a team. We had a little chant moving in fate uh, through Marissa Aguilera and of course, Darren Sami and the West Indies men at that time. A total different team to what we see now in terms of the communication between both men and women's teams. But we were so connected. We'd send messages to them. They'd send messages to us. So that was definitely a high. I think my low would be just not making it back when I think that I should have. Uh, for me, I think that my playing career was not understood because I did not get into cricket or into uh, cricket till I was about 23. So I think just not being able to understand in terms of, and not me, because I understood it. I know how my body feels. So my fitness was always there and still is there. But in terms of technical staff and, and management, just not understanding that, you know, where players stand in terms of how much they can give. I think that was probably my low for that level of cricket. ODI, your highs? Uh, yeah, pardon me? Your highs in ODI. Highs in ODI, I would have scored 83 uh, against, uh, for World Cup qualifiers. And it was interesting because I used a mongoose bat and those are one of the bats with the long handles and the short blade. So that was definitely a high. Um, Probably not scoring sufficient runs would be the low for me. 
regional women's cricket. You think enough attention has been paid to it? You think we have taken it seriously? Yes, we have organized competitions, but to prepare you for the next level in which you play during your career, you, you, you think more could have been done? I think more needs to be done. We only have a, a regional tournament, a T20 and a 50 over tournament once for the year. There are a number of men's tournaments that are played during one calendar year. There's nothing for under 19s. Only Trinidad holds a under 19 invitational uh, tournament, which Cricket West Indies has clearly jumped on. But more needs to be done for the development. There are so many teams. Like when you think about Leeward Island, who is connected with so many other teams. What about the other countries like Antigua, just to say, the other girls who are now developing there, what structure is there or, or avenues are there for data to move through to get to that Leeward Islands team? And if you plan a pathway, how would you prepare the pathway for women's cricket in the Caribbean? Because as you rightly said, we need to have a structural pathway. And you were talking about structure. So the Leeward Islands is made up of about eight countries, as you rightly said. So we have Montserrat, Nevis, St. Kitts, Anguilla, St. Martin, U.S., British Virgin Islands, Antigua and Barbuda. And then it's kind of a little bit more easy in the Windward Islands because they only have four countries to pick from, Grenada, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and the Commonwealth of Dominica. So already, as you rightly said, there's 12 countries there. That doesn't have anything at all now to do with the other four, which would be Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Jamaica, um, you, you know, and, and yeah. So you, you, you recognize in Barbados, I would say, who are going to the Commonwealth Games. What sort of structure? Because this now means this has to be a 10 year plan going forward. Because as you rightly said, we are playing, but we are so far behind that we have to now catch up. We have to get coaches trained. We have to get um, equipment. We have to get a structure. What's your plan pathway as, as we look to develop women's cricket in, in the region? So because I've been exposed to Australia cricket, because I played WBBL out there, I also, myself, Deandra, um, and a couple of the players would have played club cricket in Australia. Their structure is what is important. And I think they keep dwelling on that. England is similar. There's grade A cricket. And then even if my mother wants to play cricket, there's a level that she can join in and play at. So my thing is, we need to start structuring it in terms of grades of cricket. You need to start and managing the workload, especially of players, because you, yes, you might have someone at a, probably a grade one or a grade C that is performing good, bowling good, has good pace, looks like she's ready for, uh, say, West Indies level, but managing how many overs that, players, that player bowls and, and the amount of workload that that player has. And I think that that is important in this, especially in this setup. In the Caribbean, I think more needs to be done because of the territorially in order to get to where we need to be. Because as you mentioned, Commonwealth Games, Barbados is going to represent. What, just today I had an interview with Haley Matthews and I was asking her what have been put in place at the girls' training. It's only 10 months away, literally 10 months away. You're going away to play against the likes of Australia, England, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. You're going out there to play and you're just a regional team. Has anything been done? I mean, she couldn't answer honestly, but I don't think anything much has been done for the Barbados skills. And I understand that it's a pandemic and whatnot, but again, structure, and what do we want the outcome to be, really and truly? Do we want it to be that Barbados just goes out there and competes and, and just get beaten? Or do we want to not just plan for this year or next year, but plan for future? Because another regional team may have an opportunity to represent at those games. Hey, it is in an interesting time, interesting times ahead. And what I will do is, you know, just look to try to now bring Cal in, we'll deal with the football aspect of your career, uh, because I know he'll be thrilled to, to, to know that you played female football for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Cal, um, trust me, we, we're talking to an international sports lady here. So I, I know you'll be ready and ready to go, Cal. Yes, I mean, it's fantastic to hear her story and that she actually crossed over from one sport to the other. 
So that was my first question. You know, in our region, people try to say you're either a track star, a nap ball player, a cricket player, or you're a football player. Um, what was the view of your parents and maybe your football coaches when you went to cricket? Were they supportive or did they say, hey, hold on, we're losing one of our star players? Our population or our pool is not as large as the United States. If you don't play for us, we're not going to be in the next regional final. So what was that like? Was there a tug of war? It was an, I think a more at club level for football uh, because of the fact that I played on the left wing. So I was literally one of, I had speed. So I was literally always active, always working. Uh, for Trinidad, because I was now making it in there, I think it was much easier for me to fit into cricket with that fitness from cricket, from football, sorry. Uh, parents, I, my father died when I was a, a year and something. So, I mean, he's never, I don't have much memory of him. My mother, on the other hand, was probably just happy that I was playing sports, to be honest, because I was literally like a tomboy. I was everywhere. Anything is happening, I was there. Uh, so that I think that helped me just to choose. And as I mentioned before, once I start playing any sport, I tend to want to reach the highest level. So get into West Indies team or get into a national team, that was my will. And I just more or less played towards that. When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. I'm, I'm from a football background, but I believe that for women in the region, even in Bermuda, sometimes it's more difficult for them to be part of a cricket setup or a cricket club because there are just not as many clubs, teams, or even the National Federation organizing multiple cricket events, which you just mentioned. How challenging is it to get a young lady to choose for cricket when football is front and center on ESPN, on Sportsmax, 12 months of the year and cricket for women is not visible all year round. How do you keep that person into the sport of cricket? For me, I'd say don't choose one. I'd say play both because again, I personally understand and I'm, I'm a true testament to it that cross training is what is important. You are strong in your off season because football plays for a season and cricket plays for a season. So in, off, in the off-season of cricket, you get to do pre-season for football. So to me, that was always my way of staying fit and staying ahead so that when a cricket season comes around. But like my club team at home, I have a club team at home, Technocrats United. Technocrats is a volleyball team. I have cricket under volleyball. What we do is we train certain days on volleyball just to give the girls an opportunity to play a different sport because everybody's not built for cricket or everybody may not be built for football. So it's just being able to identify sort of athlete, athlete talent as well. And to me, that's something that because of where I reached, where my studies are concerned, I, I think I'm playing a big role in that form right now to identify and say, well, okay, I think you should play this sport because one, your height, your skill level, et cetera. And just, I think that that guidance needs to be a bit more around the setup in terms of football, cricket, uh, whichever sport it is, just athlete identification. So since we're talking football, tell us a little bit about your football refereeing days and how you got involved now in football refereeing because you never know, um, Carl maybe might bring you to Bermuda for some sort of tournament. <laughs> Um, I just, again, I like, because I like, and you know this, Vodan, that I like to be so technical with things that, yeah, if I find like, one whilst playing, I found like, yeah, there were some raw deals, of course, umpires, re referees calling decisions, and it's like, no, that's not right. So I decided to get into it in terms of study it as to, I want to know for myself. So if I question, I know what I'm questioning about. So I decided to just get into it, more or less for the fun of it, actually, to do a, a grade C and a grade E 
uh, course, a grade C and a grade B course level course. So. So you 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 what level are you at now? I'm a grade C, uh, TTFA coach, um, coach and referee. Sorry. Okay, so so that's a that's a program that is set up in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, there's uh, refereeing programs that are set up. Uh, I don't think there's none presently because of COVID and whatnot, but yeah, yearly uh, TTFA, Trinidad and Tobago Football Association, they normally host refereeing courses and coaching courses just to uh, get clubs to send more persons or communities to send more persons to be qualified in the areas. Because sometimes you go to a football game or a cricket game, just saying cricket as well, because the, the associations, uh, Trinidad and Tobago Cricket Board has also done that. You go to a cricket game and you don't have an extra umpire. You go to a football game and you don't have a, a, an extra referee, but you have somebody there watching the game that is qualified. So sometimes it's just important to have those persons around and make sure that more people in the community are, are qualified in areas of, of same. So after this in your football refereeing era, what, what's the next level for you out of this grade? Um, uh, for football, I'm just playing presently and still playing with Trin City Nationals. Uh, but I have a, a niece, a goddaughter, sorry. Uh, she's 13 years, but she's playing for Trinidad under 15s, Oriel Trotman. So I just help where training is, is concerned for her and just kind of helping to guide her a bit because she's really good. She's really good. She made it at 10 uh, to the training squad because of the talent, talent identification as well. And I mean, she, she's really growing. And again, being a, a physical training instructor myself, I'm able to help with some of her programs and her development. Now we're talking about structure and the reason why Cal and myself designed these platforms was to begin to speak to your goddaughter and you know my godson, that, that structure, or even my grandchild, my granddaughter, about the business of sports at an early age. I wanted to spend some time and talk about education and sports because in the Caribbean, too many of our sportsmen and women have had to sacrifice their sporting careers for education. So Cal was good. And mom will be telling him all the time, remember the, the, no money in sports, remember this. And so Carla had to drop the football and drop the athletics and go and, you know, go to college. And by the time he came back into the sports because he's missing about five, six years, you were able to have a balance between your career, your sporting career and your education career. Talk us through that period. Yeah, for me, uh, like I wanted to, achieved because I've achieved so much in cricket. I personally wanted to do my bachelor's. I wanted to do something in sports management because I've always liked the management part of things. Uh, I would have gone back to, to school at University of Trinidad and Tobago where I completed my bachelor's in two majors, sport management and youth growth and development. It was challenging, not just as, a, uh, as an elder student athlete, but also managing time where getting called back to the West Indies team, then being a national player, because I've always been a national player and having to juggle time for studies, time for training, rest time, liming time. It has always been ticklish, but for me, it was just about prioritizing what is important, what is due, how soon it's due, and just kind of working through that because when I made it back to the West Indies team and I went to Ireland, again, time zone difference also played a big part. So like, I don't know, I, I, I've probably been a strong person when it comes to that in terms of prioritizing and stay up, get things done. And then of course you would have meetings with your lecturers and you'd have to be up for because attendance is part of your pass mark. So my thing is parents just need to support their children. Make sure and start, if you start prioritizing with your child now in terms of, all right, plays at this time, when you get home from school, you have homework to do, you get to play for half an hour before that, just prioritize the time. Once you start putting that structure in place for your child, that becomes their daily life. 
And I think that is, is what is important. There's a lot of parents who are afraid to send them their, their children outside, uh, afraid they fall down when they fall. It's, it's, it's about no, come back inside. But that's part of life, especially country life. Climbing trees, falling down, motor skills, as I mentioned. How often do you see children playing hopscotch and moral now? It's like, it's unheard of in some territories. Like I did a program with some young girls just to help develop them. The youngest was from two and the oldest was 13 at Ultimate Indoor Facility in Trinidad, just to help the girls and teach them some life skills. They pitched their own tents. They made breakfast for themselves. They also had some games that they were able to do in terms of the same moral and hopscotch, just to get some, some motions moving as well. And of course, public speaking, being able to talk and introduce themselves and not be shy because I think it's important. I think just being able to create, as I said, avenues so that our young girls can speak and develop and feel that they don't have to hide if they're probably shaped or built differently. Because again, and when I say that, I say that to mean I'm a muscular female. People tend to get intimidated by me, right? There are young girls coming up who would feel basically the same that if I'm too strong, people may think of me this way. Look at Serena Williams. And I'm, she's literally been my mentor in terms of my motivation as to who she is as a female and what she has stood for. So I just want to say to parents, support your own. Don't cut off or make them choose in terms of cricket or football or swimming and, and cricket. Support them with both. They may just be better at the one that you did not choose. Where did this discipline come from to be able to achieve all of this? Because there has to be something that is pushing you behind the scenes. And it's just not, yes, you know, mommy saying, well, do this, do that. There, there's another element to, 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 to your greatness. So uh, uh, let's bring it out. I think it's my, how I grew up. So as I mentioned, my father died when I was a year and a half, but I grew up with my grandmother. I think his wish was that my grandmother takes me and brings me up because my mom had two other children. Uh, there's where I grew. I think everything that I've learned growing up, the tough love, the everything has been, the discipline has been from my grandmother because I mean, you all know grandmothers. It, it, it ain't easy. <laughs> And I could tell you mine wasn't. So, I mean, <laughs> I think the tough love came from that being a structured person, the discipline that I have when it comes to, if I set my mind to getting something done, it has to get done. And there are times, I mean, she's no longer with me, but physically, but there are times that I sit and I just wonder, you know, what would, what would she do in a situation like that? You know, what should, would she be thinking with me making a decision kind of thing at times? So. She's definitely has, she definitely has been my rock and she still is. Folks, if you're wondering what's happening, viewing or listening to us, we are speaking to Stacey and King from Trinidad and Tobago, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the value of sports. And my batting partner on the non-strikers end is Calvin Blankendel from Bermuda. Cal, I, I know you're, 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 you're blown away. It's your turn. Don't get so shy. Come on. <laughs> now, she says she was intimidated, so I'm trying not to get intimidated. <laughs> uh, no, on, um, let's talk about equality in sports, because you know the U.S. national women's team has been fighting or advocating for receiving the same compensation as the man. Um, the women have been more successful on the field, but the U.S. Federation believes that... Um, because there's a different marketing pool and income revenue stream that they're not receiving the same pay. What is your view on that? Women play the same sport, they represent the same country, doesn't matter who brings in the money, should there be equal pay? A lot of persons may be disappointed with my response to this, but I, probably because I'm in it, I understand it. I understand that Western East men's cricket, there's sponsors. There's, if a Pakistan is coming, there's, there's a reason why games are played at say 2 p.m. in the day and 10 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. in the evening to accommodate TV rights, which again, brings in money. And again, top players in terms of names, etc. I understand where that sponsorship part of thing comes in. 
if there is no sponsorship, and I'll just use Westernese women as comparison, if there is no sponsorship for the team, it becomes difficult to pay the same amount in terms of salary to the same team or, or to the women's team if the same income isn't coming in. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm not being biased as to, yes, women should, I mean, it could never be because a Chris Gale may get millions and a female player may not. And that's the reality. But sponsorship, we've got to play, or West Indies women got to play cricket to that level in terms of representing at a higher level in order to perform it at a higher level, in order to gain sponsorship. And then when sponsorship has been gained, then yes, you can bargain and win tournaments as to, then you can bargain as to, yeah, we want a higher a raise in salary. So my thing is, yeah, it's the same sport, but at least for cricket, I know that where TV rights and all these things are take part or, or play a big role in terms of finances, they can bargain for a better price. Until that happens for women's cricket in terms of sponsorship, because there is no sponsor for the women's team still since 20, 2008, we've literally been asking as to why, what do we have to do better? 2016 won a World Cup. I, thought, I think that more could have been done by Cricket West Indies and others just to get more sponsorship on board or corporate, what is corporate Trinidad, corporate Barbados, they could have jumped on board more where the West Indies women's team is concerned and just live off of that World Cup winning champion team logo kind of thing and just get on board with sponsorship. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, now, if you think, if you're a parent, you know, mothers, fathers, but let's talk about the women, the women guide, the women, they look at no sponsorship in sports for women, maybe in the region. Um, what is the cultural sense? Are mothers pushing their daughters into sports or are they saying, you know what, it's better to be part of a girls club, uh, you know, I'm being very generic, cooking, baking, girl guides, go to church and go to university instead of going the sports route where you give all your time and effort, but the return is maybe not economic? I think the latter is true. Uh, most persons or most parents, like I can say for Trinidad, there's a number of young girls who would have just come out of under 19 setup and they're in universities. And therefore they're choosing to, their education because at the end of it, if you're not being paid substantial, then you have to find a job. And that's something you tend to find with women's cricket a lot in your region, that you still have a job, a women's sport in your region, that you have a eight to four job and you still are a national athlete which should be unheard of. You should have a contract where a yearly contract for your country that it should be substantial that you don't have to go out to, to work just to say juggle work and national duties, especially if you're re representing at the highest level. But as I mentioned, a number of the girls in Trinidad have been or are enlisted in universities and it's a struggle for them because yeah, they could be better players in terms of make it to a West Indies team, but their parents are seen it as you need to have an education, you need to have something to fall back on. I just want to touch on football for a second. Um, Trinidad has had some success in women's football in CONCACAF or CFU, but we know the big powerhouses are Canada, um, Mexico, United States. Um, how far is Trinidad from, away from, you know, hopefully getting closer to those three nations in women's football? Like I can't say honestly at present because I'm not sure. I actually saw Melia Atten Johnson, who I know quite well, uh, making a comeback into this tri the Trinidad team. I uh, haven't fully read the post, but I think there's some qualifiers coming up. I think she also plays and a number of the girls play outside in universities for universities in the U.S., and most girls in Trinidad tend to head that way. There are a few that are literally just, yeah, play for club teams at home, but the majority of them are looking at going out and again, that educational part of things to universities and better developing their skill out there because again, funding also comes into play. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just a better avenue. So I'm not sure where they stand right now in terms of women's football in Trinidad and what what team is getting together to prepare. But again, I can only wish them all the best. 
uh, it's kind of something that I haven't really followed a lot of lately because of cricket. And yeah, I just, I just wish them all the best in the upcoming tournaments that they've got. Well, since Cal went down that road by talking about women's sport and you were talking about some of the young women and men who are in universities in the United States or around the world, is there a need and is there a program now need to be put in place in the West Indies? We have the university campus. We have one in Antigua and Barbuda, one in Trinidad, one in Barbados, one in Jamaica. Is, is there now a need now to be able to keep our sports, young sportsmen and women in the Caribbean and maybe offer them scholarships so that uh, something could be set up now where they could be closer to home, but at least feel a little centered and so the parents won't feel too bad? I know you were talking about um, there's not enough benefits coming back from sports, but if you play sports and you get a scholarship, a sports scholarship, it saves um, Carl Blankendale parents some money. You won't have to go and find 200,000 to send you to college for four years where you might be able to get a, a sports scholarship. Um, I don't think that we are educating our young boys and girls in the Caribbean too much about that. And I, I, I say that to the point of Carifta Games. Now I covered Carifta Games for a number of years. There are over 600 coaches that come to Carifta Games and all they're coming for is to offer scholarships to young athletes, male and female. Some of them don't come back to the Caribbean, but trust me, they're providing an opportunity for them and they've given them an education line. Now, you have known Stacey and King and Carl that we've had athletes who have gone off to the States and trust me, they work you. Um, you, know, you, you. That scholarship that you get, whether it's for three or four years, if you're good, sometimes you come back damaged, you come back wounded, but you have, if you work hard, you have something that you could at least say you're falling forward on. People like to say you're falling back on. I like to say you're falling forward on. I don't like this thing about falling. If you're going forward, you're going forward. So I don't know this thing about, you know, you hear some people telling you, um, you know, our grandmothers used to tell us all the time, make sure that you got something to fall back on. You know, you, you, it's only now you come big, you really kind of understand the phrase and you're saying, no, it's supposed to be advancing you. If you get a scholarship, it has to better your, your life. Um, generally, how you feel, what, what, what you think should be happening and how we're going to go about this scholarship period period to help young sportsmen and women? Uh, so, like, I understand where you're coming from because, like, I've had a challenge. I mean, university life wasn't just all fun and games and, and just, you know, getting a degree. When I got to university, there was a cricket team. I applied as, an, as a West Indian cricketer, as a West Indian female cricketer. And initially I was turned down because cricket was the cricket uh, contracts or the elite athlete program was for males. And I literally couldn't agree with it. So within my speakings and with, with whoever that I reached out to because I did literally have to threaten them, uh, I was the only female and still is the only female who represented at university for a men's team. And I played men's cricket. So again, things like that, like who's willing to take that step because there were five other girls who played for or represented Trinidad going to the same university. And it seemed like I had to be the visionary for all, but that is fine. I stood up because you're not gonna say to me that a young man who is only playing club cricket, his career is worth more than my international career. You're not gonna say that to me. So I fought for that. And I think things like that needs to happen a bit more. Most places that you go, most universities, there are certain programs for girls, certain programs for boys. If there's athletics, why is there athletics for boys alone? If there's cricket, why is there cricket for boys alone? I'm just saying things like that would need to change in the Caribbean in order to start developing and keeping our young athletes, our young girls and boys. Like I got you guys speechless with that. <laughs> yes. I was waiting for one. I will go first. I'm saying that's that's a dynamic experience, not only for you, but I can imagine you were sitting across from the man, like Mr. Spring and be telling, <laughs> advocating for yourself why you should do that. And you know, culturally, we're very male-centered. So it's like, why is this young lady even trying to convince us 
<laughs> mentally they'll probably say, you, you know the answer is gonna be no, she's gonna walk out the room. That's gonna be the end of the story. And you, for you to actually achieve your success and to be granted the opportunity to do that, that, that is a powerful statement that, you know, that's a story. If every time you go on a, on a tour a presentation or speeches, I would open up with that and everyone in the room would be like, okay, we have to pay attention to, to Miss Stacey Ann King. Um, the one question that surprised me, you would think that if you were successful, the other four would be like, we want the same thing as Stacey. They didn't join you after you gained your success to be admitted? I think the problem for them was that I, my last year, so I finished and they, uh, some of them are still there, but again, with COVID happening and no cricket, everything has been kind of put on pause, but I'm still, I'm still an, an ambassador for University of Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm still gonna fight for that. I'm still one to, to fight for that equal rights where especially cricket is concerned because there is a female football team and there is a male football team. But where cricket is concerned, I think that more needs to be done because it helped me as, as a cricketer to, you know, playing against men, it's, it's tougher. So if I can play at that level, then playing against girls was literally Sakai, as we'd, we'd say in Trinidad, I can, I can do that. So I, I think it's something that I will pursue, continue to pursue and continue to have conversations about uh, once things start opening back up in Trinidad. But yeah, I had to be that one. <laughs> when your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. But Cal, you know, it's important, you know, we're talking about the root cause of sports in the Caribbean. And here is Stacey and King identifying a serious, serious, serious issue which is affecting woman empowerment in the Caribbean. And too many times we like to come and talk about, you know, we're serious about sports. The West Indies women team won the T20 World Cup in 2016. The World Cup was held in the Caribbean in 2018. We can, we can count on our hands, Cal, how much support the women team received in the Caribbean. We just listened to the just concluded Olympics, Tokyo 2020 Olympics, which was held in 2021 because of the pandemic. We looked on social media and we see the legendary athletes in Jamaica, like Usain Bolt and Asafa Powell, had to come out and ask the general public to, hey, ease up off of the athletes. Because these athletes have an eight to four job or a nine to five job, just like what Stacey and said and are representing Jamaica at the Olympics. And when you go to the Olympics, you don't get paid. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm from? But people are so harsh, so critical, have no remorse, pass some sort of comments. In fact, I'd almost block looking on social media when it comes in terms of some of the comments that I was, I, I was seeing, because nobody knows the sacrifice of what a Stacey and King makes in terms of getting up two o'clock in the morning and maybe having to hire her own personal trainer and get her own coach and not getting any support. But we're in the Caribbean, and sometimes you wonder if we are really serious about sports or we just talk it. <laughs> and just to add to that, like I know my struggles when I started playing cricket and I wanted to take it serious. Now I worked for a security firm at that time as a security officer. I had to get to work for six 6 a.m. So therefore, where I live, Sangri Grandi, would I'd leave home, at, I'd get up at 4.30, and by quarter to five, I'd be leaving. There were mornings that I found myself having to get up earlier to train, to just to maintain my spot on that West Indies team, because you have a program that you have to fulfill. And of course, questions being asked, uh, why do you have a job when you have a contract? But at the end of the day, I said to them that a contract is not permanent. My job is permanent. So I'm not going to leave my job 
or quit my job for a contract. And therefore that meant that I now had to make, you know, just be responsible for my training, be responsible for everything, my eating, what time I train, how I train, how many, how much rest that I get and still be productive at work. I mean, I've been able to climb through that. Eventually, my, my employers became very accommodative, I'd say, uh, in terms of I left work at two instead of six in the evening, and I was able to get, get a national training, et cetera, and, put, and get some rest as well. So it, it isn't easy. At least that is a policy now in Trinidad, where as a national athlete, there are avenues that you can get leave to get to training early. But again, your employers has to be a state organization. Likewise, if I go on a tour, I don't lose funding. I don't lose my salary. So if I get selected for West Indies women's team and we or a Trinidad team and, and I go on a tour, my, my finance or my, my salary is still running at home. Trinidad has that implementation. Mm -hmm. And again, that's understanding that sport is important. Most countries don't. I remember Cordell Jack and Juliana Nero two players for West Indies team at that time who had to choose between going on a tour or being employed. There were players who lost their jobs. And to me, that is, it is tough. What I think should happen is more national players should start being physical education teachers, start getting them into PE because they're learning so much about uh, training and, and basics of, 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 you know, just activities, they can get back into schools and do our sessions. You can now employ them in schools and do and have them as, as PE teachers, physical training instructors, whether you, you let them do a course or whatever it is, just to qualify themselves and start using them that way so that they can now focus on their skill, which is playing cricket and not worry about an eight to four or an employer who is not to give them time off to go to a national session or to a tour. So there are a lot of things that could be done within the region, but again, different countries would have different, they'll have different ways of dealing with it. Wow, food for thought, food for thought. If you're wondering what's happening, if you're listening or viewing us here on our Caribbean Sports Entertainment Management Group platform, it's the value of sports and our special guest is Stacey and King from the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago just sharing her insights on her career in football and cricket, and also giving you an, an outlay as to some of the changes that has to be made if the Caribbean is going to be willing to compete on the world stage. So far, we have done an excellent job. And I know in the Caribbean, you always hear that, and I always use this term, Carl and Stacey Ann, that our school teachers, some of them, see sports just for dummies. And so when you're going to play sports, that's a no-no for some of them. You have other folks who are dedicated to sports and they understand what it means to represent your country. And we only see what has just happened after they concluded here at Caribbean Premier League, where we have two regional leaders, the Guyana, the Guyana president and the Barbados prime minister, coming out and talking about their players not being selected on the West Indies team. So you know that sport has caused that. Um, it's only sport can maybe entertain that during a pandemic. So at least that has ignited a conversation that, some, that, some, that something is happening. But West Indies cricket is almost like a brand and it doesn't matter. People are going to get agitated and sometimes the people around tend to want to feel that, hey, let's see if we can get our regional leaders involved. Rather than go and do their job, which is to be able to make sure that they put structures in place to be able to help the sport. They sometimes put their regional leaders involved and say, hey, well, why Stacey and King didn't get picked? So here's the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago wanted to know, but why is she commentating now and not being on the field? Because Stacey and King maybe decided that maybe that's the role that she was maybe going to go down. But I think you're hitting a nail on the head concerning a number of aspects. And that is why Cal and myself, we have designed this platform on Drive and football insight and the value of sports to be able to get your side of the story because we find that there are a number of hidden facts around the table. And so it's like you, you have a sewer and somebody just take a plaster and we just put it over, but we're not really digging deep into the root cause as to why that sewer just keeps seeping up all the time. 
and we don't want to deal with the hard facts. You're talking hard facts here. And when this is demonstrated throughout the entire world that this is happening, many people can come back and challenge you to say, Stacey King, what are you talking about? Because we have the facts to show that, hey, this is somebody who went through this. So we want to be able to look to change that concept. Now, I know you talked about what you studied. Let's spend some time on physical education because for Carl and myself, I don't think we really understand. And even though we have signed on to the convention for physical education with sports in the Caribbean, there's still a big log ahead between youth sports and physical education. I know it's a broad subject, Stacey Ann, but just elaborate a little bit of the importance of physical education, because right now we see schools in the Caribbean, you know, and I'm talking about in my neck of the woods. We go to sports days and it's supposed to be an eight lane track for a sports day. Only four lanes are filled. Children are struggling to even go around the track because everybody get glued now to their cellular phone. And so nobody wants to participate. And then we have a concept where your parents and there are some teachers were telling you, you can't come back into my school, my classroom sweaty. <laughs> it's, it's a real challenge. Talk to us, talk to us a little bit about physical education. Uh, well, for me personally, so I've done a physical training instructors course in Trinidad uh, via Defense Force. Uh, I have a couple, Tamiko Butler, who lives in Antigua. Uh, she would have been my batch because she did the same course with me as well. So that was eight months of learning every sport in terms of the, to the book part of it and the physical part of it, the importance of it. So it, it bothers me a lot because like my job presently is at that same security firm, MTS, where I train recruits. So I've moved from a security officer to now training their recruits because of completion of that physical training instructors course. It worries me that parents would not want their children to participate or climb trees or, or play jumping jacks, whatever it is. Uh, teachers, especially as you mentioned, you don't want them sweaty in class, but then when you see them later on in life, they can't jump rope. They can't multitask. They cannot perform a, a physical exercise and they're obese. So many health diseases come into play as well. So when you look at it, it's, it's I'd say it's appalling at times because of my job and, and what I see, but it is important because simple things as, as motor skills movement, being able to move and listen, simple things, touch your head, you know, just giving directions, touch your head, touch your knees, touch your shoulders. It's, it's difficult for people at times. And it is a struggle, but it's terrible. I did not grow up in that era. I grew up climbing trees, pelting mango, hopscotch as it may be, jumping jacks. I don't know, it's, 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 it's really different, but I think it's important. I think even as you mentioned, the phones, that's the era that we live in, but parents need to take a lot more control and cut the time in which children are on the phone. As you mentioned, sports days, it shouldn't just be, and I can get that, yeah, it's the same thing. I don't wanna run around just that, that, that circle because it's, it's boring. You can change it up. As a physical training instructor, I, I can make you run part, backward, bunny hop part. You need to get children involved in things that they like or they want to do. Like I remember doing some coaching drills with some children for uh, WIPA in communities. And I have ladders, so I brought all ladders and they were able to do different jumps in it, bunny hops in it, you know, just skipping it, just to get them to understand and to have fun because it comes down to if I don't have fun doing an exercise or doing an activity, I'm not going to want to do it. So there needs to be a balance in not just saying as a PE teacher or as a teacher, this is PE time. This is, is the time that you're supposed to have outdoor activities. Just go and play. It needs to be structured. So schools need to start structuring whether it's a basketball uh, evening whether it's a football evening, and it shouldn't just be that children have a ball and they're bouncing it or kicking it. It has to be structured. I think that is where the issue is. 
It's just go and play. It's not about structure. So make it interesting, make it challenging, make, make it that that child feels like, yeah, I want to be part of this. To me, that is a big problem. Stacey, um, having just listened to you, besides the games being played on the field and the development in the schools, you know, coaches receive their certification. Doesn't matter if it's in football or cricket. I'm a coach now. I know the game. Is there enough continuous learning? Because the game changes the way you teach children change. Children are not going to sit still now. They're going to either go on the phone or they have 15 seconds of attention instead of being, you know, when we were growing up, we would listen to our elders and just nod our head. Children are now more active because everything has to be instant. Is there enough continuous learning or conferences or forums for coaches and even the players themselves to keep learning about the differences in sport? Sport is changing. Or is it just you receive your degree, you receive your coaching certificate, and you're a coach for the next 20 years? How is it in the region or in Trinidad? I'm not, uh, but for me, I'm, well, I'm also a level two Cricket Australia coach because I've done coaching as well. Um, there's never a, a full stop to learning, not because I get a degree or a certification in whatever area, because as you mentioned, the game is evolving. There are a lot of things that are changing. So the onus should be on the individual, which is me, to stay updated with things, to see what's another country is doing. Ask a question. I mean, there must be a pool in terms of you must have friends say like I'd message somebody from Australia to see what's happening with the development. How have they changed the Milo aspect of cricket because that's the lowest level. And to me, that's where I think more work needs to be done. So I'd message and ask like what, what, what changes have they made? Every year they make certain changes. So again, everything is evolving. And as you mentioned, children are not just going to sit and, and listen to what you have to say because attention spans as well. So you need to find a way to keep them, keep them involved and, and keep them involved for that time and not for long periods because just like human beings, I'm not going to sit in front of a class for a, a one something. I'm going to get distracted really quickly as well. So just how you manage to do that and keep their attention, whether it's for short periods, give them breaks, come back again, and yeah, just get it done. But my thing is just be able to evolve with what's happening in the world as well. So you need to do that on your own as a coach, as a, as a parent, just see what's happening as a referee, whichever sport it is. When your body is challenged, it burns fuel and energy. Respond to every challenge with Altitude Sports Drink. It replenishes, restores, and prepares you for the next level. Altitude is uniquely formulated with an electrolyte blend and magnesium available in fruit punch, blue frost, and grape. Altitude. Raise your game. Now, last one for me on this topic is you, you, you have an interest in sport, you play the game, you graduate to the national, le national level, you have a career education. Let's talk about relationships. How difficult is it for a woman? Because the man, we, we, we have relationships with women and then a family is established, but the female in your group of friends or your network, is there other discussions held about, I think I'm going to give up my career. I'm going to put something on the side for the next two years to start a family and hopefully come back. I think, uh, I don't know if that conversation is being had, I'd say at West Indies level here, um, in terms of, I think it's a board thing. It needs to happen. I know for a fact, Pakistan women have started, well, they have done that actually. They put it in their program where a female, because again, it's females you're dealing with, can take maternity leave and not lose income and come back after her time. That is important because you're dealing with women. And I think it is an important question and topic that needs to be addressed in the Caribbean. Uh, because you have females and you have a number of females who are getting into age, they're getting to the 30 mark and they want to start their families. They, 
they want to know that at least there's an option that I can start my family and, and not lose earnings and still come back once I am ready and I am willing to come back to play at that level. So let's dovetail into just, just that question that Kyla asks and talk about mental health and mental health of sportsmen and women, especially women. Did you have any impact with that? Um, and how did you deal with the mental health, especially based on the challenges that you were talking to me about? Um, I think that it's an important question, especially now being in bio bubbles, uh, biosecure bubbles, and you now have a longer quarantine time. If you travel, you need to be in your room for a certain length of time until you get back a, a negative PCR test. Traveling on the whole, is, it has become a challenge and it's no longer because of these bubbles and quarantines and whatnot. Being in a good mental space is important. To me, having somebody that you are confident or, or close to that you can talk to or just you know say how you're feeling or, or they can actually see how you are performing as it might be at times because that tends to happen. A player may not be performing as, as they should and just, you may notice it because you're close to that person. And just by talking to them or reaching out to them, sometimes they don't, you know, you're not gonna open up to everybody. You're not gonna tell you know, your, your teammate if you're not close to them or your team manager that I'm having an issue or I'm having a mental issue and I don't feel mentally, you know, right in a good space or whatever. You're just gonna turn up and play and hope that it goes away. I think having, especially for teams having, uh, a psychologist there is important, somebody that the teams or the girls or the boys, whoever it is, trust or can trust because the last thing you'd want is to open up to somebody or confide in somebody and they talk to somebody else about it. But I think it's important and it's, it's needed, especially with these long tours. I mean, I've been with the men, West Indies men, uh, for three months and then I came across here. So it's literally been four months just traveling and living in bubbles. And for me, it's tough. So I can imagine how they go through, but I have my support system. I'm a mentally tough person, but I do have my down times. And I, I have people that I can call and just, you know, just to remind me of who I am and you know my purpose and that kind of thing. Sometimes it's just to hear somebody as well. So again, it, it is a tough one. And just to let you know how great you are. And while we're talking about your greatness, you've toured almost all over the world. Have you ever encountered racism in sports? I have not, to be honest. I think that I'm one of the lucky ones that have not. Um, I've known people who have, and because of course they're darker in complexion than I am, um, I've never had an issue with it. And like, to be honest, I, don't, I honestly don't know how I'd deal with it, but I want to be straightforward. So I may have just, you know, just said something about it or just let them know how I feel about it, to be honest, because I, I don't accept it. And I like the fact that, uh, you know, around the world, the Black Lives Matter stand has been, you know, it has been evolving and it has been used in most of the games, you know, just to bring the awareness. And there are some teams that don't agree with it. There are some players who just, you know, choose to stand and not take the knee for it, but in whatever way you choose to represent for it, I think it's important. It's still a topic that is out there. What's your take on it, on the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, we are all human beings, but at the same time, racism in sports, where do we start? Where do we, we stamp it out? It's, it's a fact that it's there. I think the ICC, the, the cricket, the body for cricket, because again, I know cricket, they need to put probably put more measures in place, but where it, for me, where it stands, it, it's an important message that needs to be carried out and it, it shouldn't be tolerated at all. We're gonna put you on the grid and the grid don't mean that we're going to bowl your bumpers. You know, we're just gonna just ask you some lovely questions like what's your favorite music? What's, what's coming from the Caribbean? And, not, and don't tell me Soka. So you know you got to tell me something else because I know it's that you're gonna to want to come and tell me about, right? So come. Your, your, your favorite genre of music? So I listen to all kinds of music. My playlist is mixed with everything. 
And when I say everything, it's a bit of hip hop, it's a bit of pop, it's a bit of alternative. It's definitely soca because I'm from the Caribbean. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have a mix of everything. I, to me, the message is what is important in the music, so. Who's your overall favorite basketballer? Basketballer, Michael Jordan. Why? Uh, because that's the era that I grew up in. Everything was number 23, everything was Michael Jordan. <laughs> Let's pick your brains. Let's go on the, on the cricketing side. And the West Indies have produced some legendary cricketers and you would have read a lot about cricket. Um, give, me, give me five names of people that you admired who played for the West Indies. And I'm talking about men, on the men's side. <laughs> I, I, will come to the, I, will, I will come to the women. The women, I want you to look at the overall aspect of the game. So I'm not going to limit you to the Caribbean, but on, on the men, give me five. So West Hall, uh, Sir Vivian, Brian Lara, most definitely. Um, I'd say Chris Gale because he's in my era again, and I'd definitely stay with Dwayne Bravo. Okay. And before you go to the women's section, let's look at the international scene and give me your two top cricketers. It doesn't matter whether it's Tess, ODI, or T20. Oh, Virat Kohli. And I just like to see Steve Smith back, to be honest. Okay. Let's talk about the women game now. You toured all around the world. So, some women that you have seen that, that stand out that has continued to promote the women's game. Um, I'd say Elise Perry for one, and that's because of that connection that we have with football, be, being um, footballers and cricketers. Uh, so definitely Elise Perry, Sophie Divine, because I know her personally uh, playing for Adelaide Strikers and retired now, Sarah Taylor. I think she has, like, she's almost like a, a best friend of mine uh, because we played for Adelaide Strikers and we room together, so we live together. So. You know, was sort of different. So, I mean, she's such a nice person, but yeah, those three would be my three standouts. Did you get a chance to, um, where well, you would have played against Matali Raj, right? I'm Matali Raj, Matali Raj to a point, but when you say standout to me, it's, it's those are the three that I'll choose because I know them. I don't know Matali Raj to say like, have conversations with her. Uh, she seems to be a very introverted person as well. So yeah. All right. Now, on the women's side, I know you did mention Stephanie Power, um, and there would be some other players around your, your era that, that, you know, some special moments that you would have seen from women cricketers in the Caribbean. I didn't hear that. Can you repeat that? I was saying Stephanie Power, you know, would stand out on the, in, in, as one of your top idols in the Caribbean. Any other names that you could remember off the top of your head that you would want to coincide with? Okay, so I'm having... I'm not sure what's happening, but I'm not here nuclear, but I heard Stephanie Powers. Now she has been instrumental for me uh, in my development. She's still instrumental where local cricket is concerned in terms of clubs because she's the coach of the UE women's team in Trinidad. So she's still very instrumental. She's still giving her advice uh, to young players and encouraging them. I think she's a much referee at present uh, at, at the Cricket West Indies. So, I mean, she's still involved. And I think that that's that's important to have people like her involved in women's cricket because of the experience that they can share and what they bring to us. Carl, you, you have anything for on the grid for Stacey and King? Yes, I just want to know outside of football and cricket and not going to include basketball because you already mentioned Michael Jordan. What's your other favorite sports you like to watch or even participate in? Um, to be honest, those are just the two sports that I watch, uh, football and cricket. I rarely watch anything else. I probably watch track and field just because athletic. Uh, but uh, no, nah, those, are, those are definitely my three sports. But I'm also a qualified uh, referee for um, rugby. I did that as part of my coursework uh, just, to do, just because I had to do it. I would watch some of it because I understand it. It's not, it's not a sport of choice. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. I mean, you are so well rounded in most sports. I can see why you have such a huge influence and, 
and because you have the passion, but you also have the insight. Um, let's get a little bit back to the business. Sports, we just talked about it. Sponsorship is geared towards the man in most sports. The visibility is geared towards most men. Um, where are the women and how can they play a major role behind the scenes? Do, new, do more women need to get into the boardroom of these sporting companies, whether they are Adidas, Nike, or even the actual sports teams, whether it's a Manchester United or the West Indies Cricket Board or um, a CPL team, do more women need to be on these boards to create some visibility and trickle down in fact economy? I think th that's a good question because that's something that is happening a lot in Trinidad of lately in terms of empowering women uh, seminars. Because again, they just want, they just think that there's, there's not enough females, especially those who would have played like myself, who would have played at high levels and what we can bring back. So I, I think it's important, you know, just to have, because yeah, you, you, you tend to always have a male perspective of, of things, but you know, just having another perspective, a female perspective is important. And sometimes a female representing for females or bargaining for females, like a female team is important as well. So because that female now understands what she has been through in the sport and could now, you know, just negotiate better for that team. So I, I think it's, it's important uh, for females to start to get more involved. It can only all go well. Now, recently, I'm going to go off topic. The U.S. national gymnastics team, and I believe in swimming, you know, the young ladies um, had negative experiences, abused by their coaching staff and persons that were involved in training them for various competitions. Um, how can we in the Caribbean, including Bermuda, safeguard our young women and make the parents feel comfortable to send their young ladies off on a bus to training, wait for them to come home and make sure that they feel that they are in safe hands. What are we doing good and what can we do better? So I'm not aware of the situation, but I, I generally think that knowing who your coaching staff is, who that technical staff is, is important in terms of doing your background checks as parents, know their history, know the coach's history. I mean, if you have a coach and just in general, and he has a background in terms of uh, he has been around young girls or, or you know, their reports of, of whatever. You need to know that. To me, if I'm sending my girl child or my boy child anywhere, I personally would need to know who is going, who's the other children going, who's the adults that are going to be there. You know, just those, 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 make sure and tick those boxes. I think that is important. Well, my dear, I think that this conversation has been enlightening. And for Cal and myself, on the value of sports, I think you, you touched on almost all aspects of not only women's sports, but sports in general. And like I said, the platform was designed to be able to unearth new voices, new talent that normally folks would not get a chance of listening to, but to be able to hear their side of their story. And we have heard your side of the story in all three facets of your life. And we want to just say to you that this platform is going to be a vehicle for you where you can be able to express yourself. We also want to use this platform to be able to empower women because behind our scene and behind our team is a very powerful woman who's also part of, of this team. And so we want to be able to make sure that we get you on board also as not only a mentor, but as a host, where Cal and myself one these days can be able to sit back, whether it's 2022 or 2021, and look at Stacey and King, an all-female host for a program. You know, th th those are things that we want to be able to set up. So outside of Cal and myself, you know, making sure that we get ourselves organized, once you, get your platform organized and we can be able to get an all, po all women team, certainly we, um, the platform is here for you. And I just want to say to you, my dear, that it really was indeed touching for me to have you on today. The Caribbean Sports Entertainment Management Group is thrilled to have you as our first female. So that's historic. And yeah. you, you know how touching that is for me, really. You know, I was 
talked to Cal and I said, hey, Cal, we got our first guest. And I, I kept it close to my heart before I told him who it was, you know what I mean? So I know he'll be thrilled. <laughs> Well, thank yeah, you guys for having me. I mean, it's it's been a pleasure. Um, thanks for having me. Just you know, just as express what I've been through and and my thoughts more or less. I do hope that it helps or it reaches to somebody, and you know, just be able to create that change that we all wish to see. Yes, thank you, Stacy and King, and um, for the listeners and the viewers. I just want to say I can see that she is a true athlete. And the reason why we had a game plan, Stacy, we were planning to have you open the innings as the batsman. And then something happened and we had to change the order and you didn't get upset. You listened to the coaching staff, the technical director, and we made some adjustions. You waited for your turn. And when you did come in at number five, you just did your job for the team. And no one knows what we're talking about, but you understand how we got started today. And you have shown your true colors. And I believe you have empowered not only women, but you have made man more aware of what we need to do to support women to be the best, not only on the field, but also off the field. And I look forward to having you back on many more times as possible. So thank you very much for being the first female guest on our platform. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good day. Take care. Right. Bye.